If you enjoyed today's story, please consider subscribing to this channel, where a new original sci-fi audiobook is uploaded every Thursday morning. Thank you for listening. Archangel by P. E. Rowe The crew of the Yankee Chaos was expecting me to return to the ship without Carolina. That had been the plan, but it seemed to be a bit of a surprise when I returned without Transom as well, instead bringing this Reggie woman in his place. She didn't say all that much, but I quickly got the impression that she saw everything, though, and that right fast. You're Trasp, aren't you? So said to her as I was making introductions in the atrium. Reggie acknowledged as much with a nod, but didn't say anything. Ah, hell, Birch. Here we go again. I know, I said. But what would we be doing if we reported back to the letters anyway, apart from giving important people rides through disputed territory? And where are we supposed to take this woman? Wren asked. I don't know exactly, I replied. She hasn't told me yet. I said she'd have to clear it with you all first. Reggie? I need passage to Rawl. It's mostly been arranged, but when we heard from Mycon about Carolina coming here, Sparrow knew he'd need another ship. And quite frankly, where we'd be going is better suited for a ship and a crew with the capability to fight our way out of a place like Rawl, if the need arises. Well, if it's only mostly been arranged, I'm going to assume we'll be fighting our way in and out, Lita said. Reggie looked over at Lita for a beat and said, I think it's unlikely but I certainly wouldn't advocate putting any of you or your ship into a position it would be difficult for us to get ourselves out of. What's this all about, Reggie? I asked her. Sparrow gave me the impression it was fairly straightforward, but I'm wondering what business Sparrow and his group have with the Trasp. Our business is to end the war, Reggie answered. It has been our business for decades. It's the only thing we do. It strikes me that all of you understand why. That's half true, Soch said turning his head to show her the metal side of his face. What about specifics? How does our giving you a ride accomplish that? Part of the problem with this war is that the two sides have been fighting so long there's been no meaningful dialogue for decades. We've been playing the long game, recruiting low-level officers as partners in conversation, if only to cultivate a willingness to hold a dialogue once they rise far enough up the chain for it to be meaningful dialogue. We'll be making contact with an officer we've been grooming for a leadership role. He's a very young colonel whose major general has just been killed. Our network may be able to arrange his promotion to this crucial vacancy, which would lead to considerable ability to influence the Commodore of the Western Systems of the Protectorate. We only ever talk in person, though, so there are no records of contact with us and our organization. No trail to follow. So the mostly arranged part of this trip has been with this colonel? Sosh asked. That's correct. How are we supposed to get close to him without being intercepted? I asked her. Reggie paused before answering. Again, her eyes settled on Lita for a moment before turning back toward me. Operationally, I'm not willing to reveal too much on methods. They trust us with quite a lot on their end by opening the door a crack. We trust by walking through that door. You're going to have to trust me that I'm telling you there's little danger for you behind that door, at least if we can help it. There'll be risk, though. Always is for a foreign ship in protectorate space. Ship? I called out, asking Rishi for her thoughts, if not her permission. If you guys are good, I am, Rishi said. As long as we have a quick out when we get there. That's really your department, Rishi, I answered her. I'll leave it to your judgment. I looked around to see if I could gauge how everyone felt about the matter. Any objections? They all looked reluctant, especially Juice and Wren but no one raised an objection. You seem to put a lot of weight in your ship's AI, Captain Birch, Reggie said, raising an eyebrow. It's just Birch, please. And yes, we got a good one in Rishi. Very clever strategist she is. We wouldn't go into Trasp space without her say-so first. Very well, then, Reggie said. We're all grateful for your help. It's no small matter. No, it is not, I agreed. I think since we all got together... I couldn't remember the atmosphere aboard Yankee Chaos ever seeming so intense, even with the list of dangerous situations getting far longer than I'd ever intended when we started. It wasn't just that entering Trasp space was a treacherous proposition in itself. There was something deeper about it. I suspect that all the scars we carried, with the exception of juices, all of them had come at the hands of the Trasp. Sosha and I both had a missing half took off of us. Lita had been burned half to hell before being pieced back together by her people on Tressia. 
Rand had seen more battle scars than any of us, having spent nearly a decade piecing back together the soldiers the Trasp had taken apart. And in spite of all that, everyone still seemed to make Reggie feel welcome aboard the ship, even if she was a bit aloof. Not that the atmosphere was too comfortable with one of her nationality around, but no one was outwardly hostile or resentful toward her as we approached the Protectorate, despite her origins. No doubt there were suspicions, though. Reggie, for her part, was mostly quiet. I pegged that as her personality more than any way she was trying to appear to us. She had a calm way about her, good for diplomacy, I guessed, which was funny, because Trasp weren't much known as diplomats. In fact, I'd never even heard of a Trasp diplomat before. I saw her alone one night about halfway through the transit, sitting at the table in the atrium taking a meal. I figured I'd go join her and see if I might get her talking a little. True to form, she offered up a muted smile but didn't say anything as I approached the table and strapped in across from her. We haven't talked about Ral yet, I said. I'd like to know how you expect everything to go down. There's not much to it, Birch, she said. My contact will be sending out a signal buoy with instructions that'll guide the ship in. He'll have arranged a gray zone on sensor arrays to conceal your arrival. And knowing the topography, he'll probably stash you in a crater or a canyon in the southern hemisphere where you can sit tight until it's time for me to return to Exos. That simple. She shrugged. I'd offer to escort you, but I imagine those Trasp would spot me out for a foreigner quick enough. If the accent didn't give you away, your legs sure would. You know, if we ever do succeed in getting this conflict settled, I can recommend a few places in the Protectorate that specialize in prosthetics that would be a significant upgrade, both for you and your friend. The prosthetic work our doctors do with nanomaterials is far more sophisticated than in the letters. I suppose they get a lot more practice at it. That's a fact, Reggie said, and the mandate is to put as many injured soldiers back in the field as possible, usually more capable than they were to begin with. Capable is one thing, I said. Speaking of capable, Mr. Birch, I was hoping you might lend me one of your people for the duration of my visit. Lita? Reggie nodded. It's not my call, I told her. You need her permission, not mine but one thing I will insist on is complete transparency. You'd best be clear about the circumstances on the ground when you present them to her. Of course. Then I have no objections. It's a matter of making connections, Reggie said. The more we can make, the better off we'll all be. Nobody knows which connection will be the one that ends the war, but one of them will, and she strikes me as someone who can cross the lines. I left Reggie to finish her dinner. I didn't much like the idea of Lita heading off into Trasp territory alone, or I guess with someone we knew so little about, but if Lita thought the risk was worthwhile, I'd support her call as always. By then we were about twenty hours out from our Trasp rendezvous, just on our side of the border, such as it was, always a moving line. Lita came to talk to me about tagging along with Reggie the following day. Apparently, Reggie had approached her before I had a chance to give her a heads up about it. It had come out of the blue for Lita, and she didn't really know what to say. At the time, I was up in the flight deck discussing tactics and contingencies for getting out of Trasp space with Rishi. I reckoned that if we were caught, they'd call us all spies. And then, well, from there on out, nothing good would come of it. Mind if I sit in, boss? Lita said, floating at the hatch to the flight deck. Strap in, I said. I imagine you have a lot to think about. Rishi might have some ideas as well. I'm just really interested in one thing. None of us got to see what all was going on at Exos, those people. She seems nice, Reggie, but this is a big ask, and I'm not sure what she wants out of me. She said it would be good to have a fighter at her side, that the Trasp respect that, but she could bring an arsenal and an entire company and still be hopelessly outmanned and outgunned. Doesn't make much sense, apart from the ceremonial, but that doesn't make much sense either, as near as I can figure it. This whole operation seems to be, well, I guess, what, subversion? Infiltration? So it's espionage of a sort. Spies shouldn't want to be seen or have an entourage. I don't know what she thinks I can do if things go wrong. She told me she wants to cultivate you, Lita. Said you had a chance to cross borders, maybe. I don't know. She said as much to me, too, Birch. But I'm not sure why she thinks I can talk to the Trasp. I don't have any memories of even really seeing them up close. All my combat memories from before are vague. I get flashes of dropping into lunar fields. It's more of flying into places than fighting. The drone suit. I know. We've talked about this. 
You saw them on Axos, Birch, Reggie and her people. What did you make of them? I wasn't there that long, Lita, but I guess they didn't look all that different from us. I mostly talk with Sparrow, and he's Carolina's people, not Trasp. But there were a lot of them there? A fair amount. More Trasp in Sparrow's camp than anyone else, I gathered. Do you trust him? Who, Sparrow? Lita nodded. I don't know him. Even Carolina didn't know he existed till a few days ago, really. I trust Mycon wouldn't have taken her there if he or the group posed any danger to her. Beyond that, they're strangers as far as I'm concerned. Would you go with Reggie Birch, knowing what you know? I don't know, Lita. I suppose if it meant there might be a dialogue someday, some peace to be brokered. I suppose that's what all this running around with Carolina's been about. Getting to the cause of the war so somebody can end it. More meaningful work than transporting dignitaries for the letters, I guess. But Lita, if you have doubts, just tell her no. You're under no obligation to anyone here. I certainly won't think any less of you if you don't. It'd give me a whole lot less to worry about, that's certain. I'm not sure I can look the other way if there's a chance Reggie's right, Birch. I was just hoping she wasn't a total blank slate to you. I didn't have much else to say, so it got quiet on the flight deck for a moment before Rishi chimed in. If you want to go, Lita, I have some thoughts about how we can keep a line open to you. One direction, at least. Is that so, ship? I asked. That's so, boss, Rishi said. There are a lot of technical details, but we've got some options. My eyes? Lita asked. Maybe your ears, too, Rishi said. We'll see what Ren and I can cook up. If you want to go, that is. I'll let you know soon, Lita said. If anything goes wrong, I told Lita, you know we'd move Athos to get you back. I'd do no less for any of you guys. I didn't know the technical details of how Lita's eyes worked. Up until then, I didn't even think to ask, really. I took it for granted that when she wanted us to get a picture, she could fly out the back airlock, fix her gaze on whatever she wanted to zoom in on, and if she was sharing it with Rishi, we could all see what Lita was seeing, a sort of biological camera of sorts. Of course, things are never as simple as that, especially reconstituted eyeballs of the blended nano and biotech variety. The way Rishi and Ren explained it to us when they were prepping Lita is that the problem was range. If she got outside a hundred kilometers or so, we wouldn't be able to catch the signal. So Rishi had Juice rig up a pin repeater, and as long as Lita was able to drop it outside the meeting place before going inside, we'd have her feed. And the bonus was that Ren and Rishi had cooked up a way to piggyback an audio signal on that transmission. It wouldn't be clear, and the whole transmission would lag by half a minute or so, but as long as she got that repeater deployed, we could more or less watch the Lita show from wherever we were hiding out on the planet. Juice and Ren cooked up a microscopic, almost invisible earpiece that Ren installed in Lita's right ear canal. The Trasp would have to scan her head to know it was there, and even then, a cursory scan would miss it. Reggie had made it clear that the whole basis for these meetings was trust and good faith. She had a long relationship with this young officer she'd been grooming. So went the story. Still, Lita wanted that lifeline as much as we wanted it for her. We all agreed that none of this was any of Reggie's business. If anything went wrong, we'd have a fix on Lita, and we'd have operational intelligence from the field. She wouldn't be able to hear us, but she'd have the knowledge that we were watching and listening at all times. Rishi, especially. Which, I suppose, was more or less what we were all used to anyway. When we came up on the coordinates Reggie gave us in dead space, there was a buoy waiting for us, so she said. At first, Rishi didn't pick up anything, but Reggie gave her a code to transmit to wake up the buoy, and sure enough, as soon as Rishi transmitted it, the beacon sprang to life with directions and coordinates. There were very specific travel instructions for Rishi to follow, multiple tiered jumps, followed by a rendezvous in a deep canyon on the surface of Rahl a residential world before the war that had been turned into a military supply depot, according to Reggie. It was never a population hub to begin with, but like many of the Trasp worlds, the youth all got shipped out in the early years of the war, probably with the hope that it'd all be over soon enough, that the kids would come home and pick up on their colony where they'd left off. Most of that first generation died in the war, and of the ones that didn't, most of them never did come back to Rahl. I can't say too much more about specifics to outsiders, Reggie said. But you all know war. You can imagine. Yeah, I told her. We got a few ghost worlds in the letters. 
I hadn't meant for that comment to sting, but it seemed to cut her deep. Perhaps a trasp employed full-time trying to end her people's war understood better than the rest of her kind the damage the war had inflicted on the societies around it. Anyway, we all had an image of the kind of planet we were flying into, because we'd all seen a few like it. When we crossed over to Trasp space, Rishi switched off the transponder and took us as dark as a ship could go. It was a day-long trip from the border to Rao, at the halfway point of which, Rishi switched on the transponder again, using the spoofed signal embedded in the message on the Trasp buoy. It was for a different class ship, a little four-person short-range cruiser, but Reggie assured us nobody would see us from close enough range that they could peg a discrepancy. As we got closer to Rahl, I was shocked by the state of the protectorate, or at least the space traffic anyway. It always projected power at their perimeter, and maybe it was just that this was my first time behind it, but that perimeter, in the minds of outsiders anyway, was always presumed to have some heft behind it, Unless the colonel had the sway to clear out an entire sector so we could sneak in, that projection of power was looking almost entirely like a facade. This empire was a soap bubble, with all its mass at the margins. I'd never had a sense like this before, that the war actually could end, that the Trasp could be defeated, but just one look at that sector's flight maps gave me the impression that one good pinprick could bust the whole Trasp protectorate apart. The planet, too, was a wide-open port, Who's to say it wouldn't have sprung a massive response from the surface if we popped up under a letters banner out of nowhere uninvited? But again, it was shocking to have a lifetime's worth of misconceptions blown to bits in the span of a few hours. The hard, unconquerable, cerebral, tactically-minded Trasp had a soft, soft underbelly, and perhaps only a handful of people outside the Protectorate knew it. When Rishi set us down in the canyon, there was a little puddle jumper of a shuttle waiting for Reggie there. No comms were allowed. In fact, everything but the life support had to get shut down. We complied to a degree, but of course Rishi would stay online, as well as our connection to Lita. There wasn't much as far as a sending off, as we all expected them back aboard shortly, and to make anything more of it than any other mission would have seemed odd. They just stepped out the back airlock and walked over to the Trasp shuttle. Didn't even wear suits, just civilian-grade nanosheets. And given how closely Yankee Chaos was tucked in there to that shuttle, neither of them even wore a rebreather, just the air they carried with them. From that point, all there was for us to do was watch and listen to make sure everything was going smoothly. It was hard to make out through Lita's scratchy feed what they said at the airlock, but we could hear Reggie respond, Snapdragon, here to see hard hat. Passcode, we could hear the response. Cadence 1, Aurora 6, Sahara 17, Impulse. The airlock opened, and Reggie stepped in, followed by Lita. Once they were in the airlock, we could hear the voice of the Trasp escort more clearly. Who's your new friend, Snapdragon? he said. Reggie looked back at Lita for a good beat, considering, then responded, This is Archangel. Can you outfit her? Yeah, I think we can manage. Then he opened the airlock. When they stepped into the shuttle, I was a little shocked to see how young this contact was. I was expecting to see some grizzled old veteran, but from the looks of the boy, he was maybe all a twenty years old, wearing a major's uniform and insignia. And maybe it was my mind jumping right back to the idea of the whole Trask Protectorate as a soap bubble empire. And then it occurred to me, the young man could be older than I figured, and I was just getting old myself. Probably it was a little of both. The young major handed Reggie a stack of clothes a full colonel's uniform complete with colors and insignia. Then he disappeared for a few minutes after promising to return with a full kit appropriate for Lita, or Archangel as he called her. When he got back, Rishi played censor so Lita could get changed in private. It was a few minutes later when the feed picked back up. It was just Reggie and Lita there in that back airlock annex. You wear that uniform well, Reggie said to Lita who turned her head and spat on the floor of the airlock. I didn't mean it as an insult, Reggie said. I did, Lita responded. Reggie didn't seem offended. Instead, there was this weird skepticism on her face, as though she knew something Lita didn't. All I meant, Reggie said, was that you're wearing the colors, bars, and arrows exactly as we would wear them. It's different in the letters. Not everyone would get that right. It's obvious how they should be worn, Lita said. And let's get one thing straight. 
I'm here to help you make peace between the worlds. I'm not here to make friends. I wake up in a cold sweat almost every night of my life because of the trasp. I had my eyes burnt out and every part of my skin cooked to a crisp by the trasp. If I can stop the war and make it so nobody else has to go through what I went through ever again, I'll grit my teeth and pretend for long enough to get the job done. But I will never forget who took everything from me. All of that is fair, Reggie said. It takes courage to take a step like this. Tremendous courage. When the Major returned, they put their clothes in a bag and dumped it on the ground outside the shuttle. Then they took off. We lost Lita's feed then and wouldn't pick it up until she got the pin repeater deployed. By the time Lita's feed came back, we were all nervous. None of us had expected it to be out for nearly three hours. The flight itself shouldn't have taken more than an hour, and deploying the repeater, nearly invisible as it was, should have been little trouble at all for Lita. Why it took so long for her to get it done was a mystery for another day, though, because there were no clues on the feed once it started to come in. They were already in the colonel's company by that point. The young major was with him, and the first several minutes of the feed was so poor that Rishi couldn't even interpret. But as she started to dial it in, we would get bits of words that made sense from the context, until finally, Rishi was able to discern enough to roll captions. The video was decent enough to see. The discussion was about the business Sparrow's network had come to talk to the colonel about, trying to get the colonel that promotion. One thing that became clear about the way this colonel operated, perhaps a trait of the Trasp as well, but he was very transactional. He mentioned past favors and future expectations. He made it clear that he promised nothing beyond a continued channel with Sparrow's network, even if Sparrow was able to secure the promotion for him. The protectorate came first. What was unclear to us, as spectators to this whole affair, was how Sparrow could garner that type of influence within the protectorate. Money, presumably. But that too wasn't entirely clear. Given that Sparrow was supposedly cut off from the Dreesen family, and was a distant cousin at best. I suppose, though, even distant Dreesen still had access to their share of resources, even the outcast ones, maybe. That first discussion lasted the better part of an hour. Formalities, questions, offers and counteroffers. The situation seemed normal until the colonel set his sights on Lita. He pegged her for military from the jump. Only the wrong military. He thought she was Trasp. You carry yourself like a ranger. Maybe a steelhead, but you've seen real action, he said to her. How is it you were discharged, Archangel? Or were you? You know better than to breach protocols, Reggie told him. You issued the arrows yourself. Yes, I did, the colonel replied. And I expect my junior officers and everyone else that sets eyes on her to respect them, which they will. But if I want to ask a question, I'll ask her a question. I expect it answered. Lita turned to Reggie, who gestured toward the young Major. He looked over at the Colonel. Major, go get me a retinal scanner and Lucille. We will meet you on the south floor. Evening exercises, sir. Negative, Major. Just a little exhibition before dinner. Call in Lucille. And on second thought, send this scanner in with her. You're dismissed for the evening unless I call for you. Sir, the Major said snapping off a salute and retreating from the colonel's office. What is this about, colonel? Reggie said. I smell a deserter. This woman is Trasp. She carries it in every fiber of her being. Reggie put her hand up to calm Lita, who was probably fixing to spit on the floor again. This is out of line, colonel. Part of our agreement is anonymity for all parties. We don't burn you down and you don't burn us down. That was before you brought a deserter onto my base. I'm no Trasp, Lita said. I'm Tressian, and a veteran of the letters. You're no Tressian. What would you know of my people? I know a lot of your people, the Trasp people. You're either from Calergal or Rivera. You sound like maybe you're from Carhall. I can't quite place you. It's no matter. The retinal scan will. All of us watching Lita's feed together in the atrium aboard Yankee Chaos looked over at Wren simultaneously wondering the same thing. Her eyes scan normal, Wren said. They'll just come up with a big zero, because her new retinas couldn't possibly match her original eyes. And even if they did, there's no way Lita would be in a TRASP database anyway. Actually, if anything, it'll put her in the clear. It was a relief to hear it from the expert, 
but still, there was something about this colonel's curiosity about Lita that had us uneasy. I'd met people like that, especially military people, who wouldn't take no for an answer. Not much was said, either aboard Yankee Chaos or halfway across the planet where the events we were watching were unfolding. The three of them walked down to the south floor together, and though we could tell from the way Lita was scanning the rooms that she was nervous, looking back at Reggie's face a lot, she didn't give anything away in front of the colonel, and Reggie didn't say nothing either. The south floor the colonel referred to was an indoor training facility, a gymnasium of sorts, TRASP style. It was dark in there compared to the colonel's office, with colorful backlights on the walls. Look familiar, he said to Lita. Should it? Lita answered. He scoffed at her dismissive response and waited for a few moments before the far door opened. In came a young Trask woman dressed in a training gi, carrying a staff in her left hand. This is Lucille, the colonel said. She's a junior lieutenant and the best female fighter on our base. You're going to fight her. Lita started laughing. Lucille, come over here and meet Archangel. First we're going to find out who she is. Then you're going to spar. You better not put a staff in my hand, Lita said to the colonel. When I knock her out, I'm coming after you next, hard hat. Soch was shaking his head beside me as the scene unfolded. Poor kid, he said. Hope they got a doctor as good as Wren on that base. We all chuckled except for Harold, who looked over at us humans and said, Lita will go easy on her. It's not in her nature to be needlessly hurtful. The key word there was needlessly and the rest of us humans might have thought there was a need. Anyway, we kept watching. Lucille, you were told to bring a retinal scanner down, the colonel said. Do you consent to my scanning you, Archangel? Or do I need to get some people in here to make it happen? Have at it, Lita said. Lucille tossed the pen-like implement over to the colonel, who approached Lita. A bright light lit up our float screen as he scanned Lita's eyes. There was no response from the colonel who seemed to be looking over his shoulder, waiting for something. Praetor, he shouted, apparently to the base's AI. Negative confirmation on identity, a voice echoed through the room. As I said, Lita stated, staring over at the colonel, I'm not Trasp. Please, indulge me still, he said, gesturing toward the lieutenant. Lucille, attack her, please, hand to hand. Lucille dropped the staff. Lita stepped away from Reggie the second the girl moved toward her. The young lieutenant's arms were up in a fighter's pose as she approached, far too fast. We could see a strike that Lita blocked and a knee to the girl's upper leg as Lita stepped behind her, uplifting the girl between the legs in the same motion. Then Lita fully body-slammed Lucille to the mat so hard it sounded like the impact squeezed a death rattle out of her. Lita stopped. Poor Lucille was flat on her back, shocked and wide-eyed with her arms and legs slowly reaching out aimlessly at the air as she gasped for breath. Lita stared over at the colonel. Care to step in here, boss? He crossed his arms. When Lita looked down again at Lucille, it looked like the girl had caught her breath a little. Lita offered her a hand and Lucille reached up, still wide-eyed, breathing hard, but breathing. We spectators were laughing and shaking our heads. Lita was a proper ass-kicker at baseline, and she had plenty of bio-enhancements to boot. Staffs, the colonel said, taking off his outer jacket. You know how to use one, I imagine. You won't have to imagine long, Lita said, stepping over to the weapons rack and pulling down a black polymer staff, casually spinning it like a fifth appendage, testing the weight of it, or so it seemed. I was a division champion, the colonel said. You should put on a helmet, hard hat. Lita said. I can't promise I won't slip and crack your skull. I will if you do, he replied. A proper match. Lita shrugged, it seemed to us. Then she walked down to the end of the weapons rack and picked out a helmet. They padded up and then added padded sheaths to the end of their staffs. The colonel put in a mouth guard, giving Lita a look like she might want the same. You're not going to hit me, she said. Not in the mouth, anyway. Have it your way, he mumbled through the mouth guard. Then they stepped onto the mat. We'd seen Lita train freehand, especially on our free days back on Canis while Transom was getting back on his feet. She'd go off on the beach and run through her movements. Modes, she called them. A Tressian way of prayer, she'd explained. None of us had seen her properly fight with a weapon. I don't think even Soch would have wanted any part of that. I know I wouldn't. 
The colonel came at her. He was good. We could tell that much from the fact he wasn't cracked out cold in the first few seconds. I kind of wish we could pan around and watch her, Juice said, instead of just seeing her perspective. All the same, Wren said. I'd rather have our perspective than his. It was almost simultaneous to Wren saying it. The colonel's lead leg, overextended by a touch, made a rich enough target that Lita in a sweeping strike, while stepping to the side, cracked the colonel in the Achilles, toppling him to the mat, where he tried to roll forward as though to keep fighting, before the shock of the blow set in. Instantly, instinctively, as soon as the pain hit, he dropped his staff and reached for his foot, curling up into a ball. He didn't cry out like poor Lucille had, but he was finished. Lita just stood there. It was almost more of an insult that she didn't strike him with a few more performative blows to force him to tap out, instead calling the match on her own. I thought you said we'd be making friends here, Snapdragon, Lita said, looking over at Reggie. Is this how Trasp make friends? It's a funny way of doing it. She turned back toward the colonel, who'd rolled to his hands and knees by that point. Lita tossed her staff and helped him to his feet, offering a shoulder as he tried to take a step or two to shake it off. He limped gingerly forward before brushing her aside and taking a few steps. You're quite a fighter, Lucille said. Where'd you learn all that? From the holy warriors at the Tresian Vassars, Lita said. I trained there and served with them in the letters before I was wounded in battle. Against us, Lucille said. Lita nodded. I'm sorry that happened to you. Reggie looked over at Lita, tilting her head as if to say that was some progress. A Tresian holy warrior, the colonel said. First and last one I'll stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with. I'm grateful you didn't see fit to test the helmet. You didn't stick your head out, Lita said. All the same, the colonel said. I'd like to host the two of you in the officer's mess for a proper meal. Lucille escorted Lita and Reggie to a large room that seemed to be a guest quarters. There were two beds, which was a sign that this colonel was expecting this stay to go a bit longer than we had all bargained for. Given the circumstances, though, there wasn't much any of us could do but let it play out and hope for the best. After Lucille left them, Reggie turned to Lita and said, Watch what you say, because we are almost certainly being recorded in here. That's a fact, Lita responded, eliciting a dull laugh from all of us. You shouldn't have hit him so hard, Reggie said. I had no idea what you were capable of, but I figured you for smarter than that at the very least. It was a love tap. I could have snapped a tendon if I wanted to hurt him. That love tap might have cost us. Humbling a rising officer like that in front of one of his juniors, he's not going to forget it, and it certainly won't make him any less curious about you. I don't know what you want from me, lady. I come, I get insulted by you, by him, then thrown on the mat with a kid. For what? What was that even about? I have no idea. I suppose he wanted to see if you were trained like a Trasp warrior. Well, he got his answer, didn't he? Let's hope, Reggie said. Trasp warriors are garbage fighters. Cannon fodder. Are you listening, hard hat? Or whatever your stupid code name is? Garbage fighters. Reggie gritted her teeth. Be silent. She took a deep breath. We are guests here. We are here to cross lines. To broker discussion. And I will discuss when the time comes, Lita said. I will not be insulted. A Tressian holy warrior. I never would have guessed it. I presume that means you know how to meditate. Lita shook her head at the suggestion. Visualize a pleasant evening, peaceful conversation, holding your tongue, and committing no acts of violence against the officer we've come here to befriend. Lita didn't exactly scoff at the suggestion but it was easy enough for us to figure what she thought of that. She did meditate, though, and it was another two hours or so before anything substantive happened again. We took advantage of the lull to eat dinner and nearly broke out the sabaka sticks it was going so slow there. I got the sense among the crew of a mild optimism that the rest of this meeting would go off without a hitch. Then the colonel's dinner happened. At first, he and Reggie spent the bulk of the time discussing the specifics of their accord the ways a relationship could manifest certain outcomes if need be. Reggie asked about the Commodore and how much influence young Hardhat could have opening up outside diplomatic channels, whether that be with Sparrow's network or a third-party mediator. A lot of groundwork, it seemed. They ate, they talked, and for the most part, the colonel seemed to be ignoring Lita until the meal finished. 
When the all-purpose bots exited after clearing the table, two pair of trasp strike bots entered, taking up a position several meters behind the colonel. I have more questions, he said, about her, Archangel. You weren't satisfied enough this afternoon, Lita said. I had suspicions that you were a deserter. I have other suspicions now, but I know for certain you're not a trasp deserter. I told you I wasn't trasp. Yes, we'll get to that. I had Praetor run a comprehensive movement analysis on your fighting style, and the results were interesting. So interesting that I sent the Major back to the south floor to retrieve your staff, Archangel, so we could run a DNA test on the staff. And, well, if your fighting style was interesting, this, this was something else entirely. You have no idea who you are, do you? I know exactly who I am. Your retinas didn't turn up anything because your eyes have been rebuilt. Am I wrong? Lita didn't respond. Those aren't your real eyes, are they? Lita didn't answer. She looked over at Reggie, seemingly to see if the older woman had any intention of intervening. It was clear from the look on Reggie's face that the situation was out of her control. Do you have memories before Kendry? Excuse me? It was the city of Maddox on Kendry where they found you, no? I'm guessing probably in a basement or some ground-level concrete structure, buried under a mountain of rubble, half dead. Is that right? We could tell from the picture that Lita sat up straight in her seat. His description sounded exactly like what Lita had told us. What do you think your name is? That is, what name are you using, Archangel? Not on this silly misadventure of a mission this silly woman has dragged you on. I mean with your crew out on that spaceship you parked in Ragged Canyon. What do they call you? Birch? Wren said. I put my hand up to quiet her. Lita was quiet, too. Boss, Rishi said. Don't spin up, ship, I told her. If you do it now, he'll know we're on to him. And we're on a delay here. If this colonel were going to kill us, we'd be dead already. Just keep a weather eye. I kept watching Lita, who was looking around the room, seemingly extremely uncomfortable in her chair. It's okay, he said. You're not in any trouble. I told you. We know you're not a deserter. My name is Lita. That is my name. That's who I am. And you have no memories before Kendry. None? Fragments. You don't know your full name, Lita, do you? Lita shook her head. Would you like to? You have a family, you know. Do you remember? You have a brother. Lita began shaking her head. It's a lot, the colonel said. I know this is probably a shock. When I found out who you really were, Lita, I couldn't imagine what you'd been through. I couldn't believe it was you, actually. What those doctors must have done to save you on Tresia. Frankly, it was quite a shock to me. I am not. Lita didn't finish the statement. I am not. I'll give you a minute to let it sink in, Lita. You were reported killed in action on Kendry listed among the honored dead of the Trasp Protectorate. Lita kept shaking her head. Now, as for your friend, codenamed Snapdragon, we had an understanding. It had something to do with coming alone. We agree to look the other way on a number of things. You don't share information on the Protectorate with Trasp's enemies. But when all these funny things started happening with our dead war hero friend here, Snapdragon... We had a satellite scan the canyon. It turns out, Regina Haas Boggs, that you brought a few friends with you on a joyride into our space. If this whole network you were cultivating with Athos's first family wasn't treasonous, escorting spies across our border certainly is. Backdoor diplomacy is one thing. Espionage, though. The letter of the law is clear there. You're just as guilty as she is, Lita said. That's true in a sense the colonel said, but there is exactly zero evidence of anything, because we only talk in person. But if I were to turn that ship out there into a flaming pile of metal, along with, I'm guessing, Lita's new friends from the letters, right? Then there'd be proof of something. Lita's eyes went right to the strike bots. I thought you might be confused about loyalties for a while, he said, so I wanted to make sure there wasn't any question about doing anything, well, questionable. I'll kill you if you hurt them, Lita said as cold as she'd ever said anything. And after I'm done with you, I'll find your family and kill them for good measure. 
an eye for an eye. You misunderstand me, Lita. He paused. Lita. Lita. It actually suits you quite well. It should. It's my name. What do you want, Colonel? Reggie asked. I don't want to blow up your friends, Lita. This visit was supposed to be a visit to build bridges, and I still think it can be. What do you think, Snapdragon? I am always hopeful. What I want is her. I want Lita. And then I want you to go back to your ship, to fly back to the letters and tell Sparrow that if he ensures my promotion, I will keep an open dialogue with him. I may even attempt to sway policy for him when it redounds to the Protectorate's benefit as well. When our interests align, we can be friends. But she stays. That's the price. Reggie looked at Lita. Bear in mind, Lita, the colonel said. The alternative is that I rain fire on that canyon where your friends are. I only need to say the word. I'll stay, Lita said. I'll stay. I thought you'd see reason. Reggie was shaking her head. I'll never convince them to leave without her. You're just going to have to be persuasive, Snapdragon, the colonel said, because if that ship deviates from the flight plan by a meter, I will open up on it, and Sparrow will never hear from any of us again. Do I make myself clear? Lita looked over at Reggie. The older woman was shaking her head. You knew, didn't you? Lita said. You knew what I was. Reggie shook her head. I didn't know he'd check your DNA, love, but I knew you for one of us the second I set eyes on you. You're trasp, Lita. You carry it in your bones. At those words, things got a little heated back on the ship. So slashed out, and the others tried to quiet him. As confused and angry as I was, there was stuff going on we still needed to hear from that dinner table. You mean we've been flying with a damn trasp all this time? So shouted. She didn't know, Ren said. Hey, I shouted over them. You were flying with Lita. Lita. And she's still in there. We need to be smart about this. Because if we're still here, that means Reggie is on her way back here right now. I'm gonna crush that lion trasp woman's neck, Sosh said. The second she steps in the ship, if we ever want to see Lita again, Sosh, we're going to need help from some genuine TRASP operators, I told him. How many of them do you know? Birch, we're not going to leave her, Ren said. We can't just leave her with him. What's he going to do with her? I don't know, Ren. Let them have her, Sosh said. You don't mean that, I told him. You're angry. I get it. I'm angry. We need to figure this out fast, though. Sosh got up from the table clenching both his fists, the flesh and the metal. He turned his back to us. I understood. My emotion was more of disbelief than anger, though. Her being trasped didn't change my opinion of the woman I knew any, but I don't reckon I'd suffered as much as Sosh. And Lita, I don't think there'd been an ounce of deception in it. The memories she'd shared with us, the false ones, I think she genuinely believed them. So we trusted in who she'd said she was. And there was no question in my mind that Lita, our Lita, was suffering the same anger and confusion and pain that Sosh was about her identity at that same moment. I also knew I wanted her back. She was family. Birch, Wren said. Ship, keep recording that feed until the last second we're in range, I told Rishi. For now, we need to get our heads right about this. We're not leaving, Wren said. We can't stay, Wren. We are so far outgunned we'd be dead before we got close. All of us. We still have two advantages, though, as I see it. Lita is still transmitting, and they don't know about it, for one. Two, Reggie has no idea we've been watching. How is that an advantage, Birch? Sosh said. I don't know yet, but we can at least string her along and see how she tries to spin it. As long as Lita's transmitting, though, we can find that signal. In all a trash space? Sosh asked. It's something, Ren said. I don't know how the trasp operate. Juice interjected, and we listened, because he always had a cool head about him. The thing is, they're people like the rest of us, regardless of what we think of them. The colonel said something about a brother. It means she has family. Eventually, I'm sure they'll let her go home, reunite with her family again. If we can figure out who she is and where that'll be, I imagine we can at least get a message to her somehow, especially with the signal transmitting. We could get her back. So shook his head. We have to try, I said. It's Lita. I want no part of going any deeper into Trasp space. 
I ain't risking my life for any trasp, even Lita. Nobody's asking yet, Sosh, but we'll need Reggie. So when she gets back here, you will not crush her neck, and you will not say a word about what we know until Rishi and I say so. You're the captain, I guess. Yeah, Sosh, I guess I am. In the moment, we missed how the situation unfolded in the room with Lita and the colonel. All we knew was that by the time we'd all settled down enough to turn our attention back to Lita, Reggie had left the room and was on her way back to us. It was just Lita, the colonel, and those strike bots. I asked Rishi to monitor the feed for critical information, but to turn it off while we got our story straight. The plan was to play dumb, to convince Reggie we didn't know what had unfolded on that Trask base. I still wasn't sure what good that'd do, but I knew I wanted to see whether she'd be straight with us. I expected she wouldn't be, but I had no idea how I'd react until the moment. I suppose it was going to depend on the nature of the lies she told. When Reggie returned alone, she looked nervous. I have some news, she told us. Then she went on to explain that Lita had agreed to stay on with the Trasp officer in a sort of exchange and Sosho must blew it by asking her whether there shouldn't be a trasp that came back in exchange, on account of that being the meaning of the word and all. Somebody for somebody. That's not how it works, Reggie answered, showing a bit of the nerves I'm sure she was feeling. Reggie promised everything was fine, and that we'd see Lita again soon, and I asked her if we shouldn't have Lita's assurance that all was well, hear it from the horse's mouth, so to say. And again she told us that's not how it worked with the trasp. Lita had volunteered. I imagine she was astonished when we reacted with skepticism and a muted anger for a few minutes before I gave the order for us to take off, so she'd lied to our faces about Lita for a second time. We took the jump out per the colonel's flight plan, and I was positively furious at her, but I figured I'd sleep on it, try to pin her down again in the morning and see what she had to say. Rishi shared the last of the footage she had of Lita with me that night. Damned if I didn't get madder and madder. Rishi was pretty angry, too. I guess as angry and emotional as she could get. The following morning, Reggie was at our table, playing that same quiet act she'd played on the way out to Trasp Space, smiling at us unassumingly. I went out to sit with her just as I had at the start of the run, and she flashed me the same smile she had days before. Only now, I could see it for what it was. There'd been some real conversations at our table in the past year, I thought, staring across at this snake of a woman. There's one thing I don't get, I said to her. How are we supposed to get Lita back from this exchange? You know, when she wants to come back home? She'll contact us through the colonel, Reggie said. Through the colonel. Sparrow will get word. I wasn't having it anymore. I thought about how certain people we knew would do business with a Trasp envoy who was lying to our faces. Then I asked Rishi whether we'd crossed back into the letters yet. She confirmed that we had. I left the table, and then I told Sosh not to say a word to the woman while he stuffed her in the airlock. Then I let her simmer there. I even had Rishi pop the release valves randomly every now and again to give her the sense of just how sharp the knife was hanging over her head. I left the light off in there so that when I went down there and appeared just outside the window, she could see me clearly. Regina Haas Boggs. I piped into her through the intercom. You are an intelligent woman. An intelligent woman floating in an airlock. I'd say the subtext is obvious. Now I'm willing to listen if there's something you'd like to say to me. How do you know my name? She whispered. Not so much to me, but to herself. Then it dawned on her. We'd been watching, listening. We knew. I'm sorry, Birch, she pleaded more than attested. I didn't know he was going to take her. She started crying. You had a sense of it, I said. Now I thought you'd be smart enough, being in the position you are now, to be direct and honest, maybe even forthcoming. But I can see that's not the case. So I'm going to make this very simple and ask the questions I want answers to. Airlock opens two ways and two ways only. One way goes right out into space, and contrary to popular belief, death is not instantaneous and not painless by any stretch. The other way opens back in here. Not saying you'll find too many friends on the other side of this door, but there's breathable atmosphere and heat. I'd think you should be highly motivated to tell me the damn truth for once. I will, I swear. 
You knew Lita was trapped from the jump, correct? Yes. Now this is the key question. Don't you lie to me, woman. I won't. You suspected he'd pick her up, didn't you? She paused for a beat and considered. I thought he might take an interest in her, and I figured he'd try to ID her. I had no idea who she was, though. You wanted him to take her, didn't you? She was shaking her head as if to deny it, pausing, considering. Rishi, I said, remove the safety measures from the outer lock. The outer door clicked, and the motor in the air valves hummed and hissed. I did, Birch. Yes, I did. She's perfect. I've been waiting for someone like her for years, and she was just here on this ship, like serendipity. What do you mean? She's trasp, but she's not trasp anymore. She can see both sides, speak for both sides. They're not going to harm her, Birch. She's a war hero. Honored dead. She'll be like a living god amongst her people back home. Venerated. Her word will carry weight. And what you've given her, a home, friends, love, support, she'll never be able to see any of you as enemies again. She will speak this to her people. You have to believe me. All I want is to end the war. Lita can help. She will help. Please, Birch. You know, ship, I said to Rishi, the one thing I can't stand more than anything about people like Regina here is that they're so convinced they know the right thing that they never bother to tell the truth about what they're doing because they don't have a lick of faith in us little people who don't know any better. The fighters, the farmers, the engineers, they think they have to trick us into doing the right thing rather than asking us for our help. What do you think, ship? Is it that they don't trust us or that they don't deign to ask for our consent because they might have to share the credit on the off chance their ideas pan out? A mix of both, I reckon, Rishi said. Your call, ship, I said. You were closer to Lita than any of us, and I thought of her as a damn close friend, if not a sister. The outer airlock gave a hard pop, and Reggie screamed. It wasn't what she thought, though. It was the safety on the outer lock door re-engaging. We're going to need help from Sparrow to get Lita back, Rishi said. And sure, we could lie to him, misrepresent the way things happened out here, tell him the Trasp double-crossed Reggie. Some people would do that, but I don't think we're those people. Reggie, realizing that she wasn't getting spaced, fixed her gaze back on the window and was about to pour out her gratitude for Reese's mercy. I didn't want to hear it. I turned out the light and left her there to float and shiver for a few more hours before letting her back inside. That night, Rishi and I watched the footage from Raul again, all the way through, just to be sure we hadn't missed anything important. That last bit was tough to take. What she'd said, she stayed for us because she didn't want us to die, not because she had some higher calling like Reggie believed, like it was her destiny to bring two worlds together, and maybe it was, but she stayed for us, so we could live. I damn well wasn't going to leave it at that, despite what she said. She told Reggie, Tell the captain that we're family, and that I'll always find my way home. And she knew we were listening, and I knew she'd never stop trying to get back to us. I wasn't going to leave her out there. So it was back to Sparrow to drop off our guest and to not take no for an answer on getting Lita back. There was more, of course, but all that was for another day. For now, there was a single significant certainty. I said it aloud to make it official, and Rishi echoed it right back to me. We're coming for you, Archangel. Whatever your name is, you'll always be Lita to us. We are coming, and we'll see you soon. Archangel. This has been an original story written and read by P.E. Rowe. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the story. If you did like what you heard, please show your appreciation by liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. Every like, comment, and new subscription helps me to continue to grow and reach new listeners, and is much appreciated by the author. If you're still here listening and haven't subscribed yet, I hope that if today's story didn't sway you, you'll come back soon and give me another opportunity to earn your subscription. I have a growing collection of other sci-fi stories like today's freely available on this channel and on my website, rowlit.com. I've put together collections of my stories if you're interested in getting portable, ad-free access to my sci-fi shorts, and it's a great way to help support the creation of more stories like today's. The first collection, The Prospectors, contains some of the channel's earliest uploads, 
and the second collection, Failsafe, contains more recent works. Both titles are available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook formats and can be accessed through the links in the description. I hope to catch you back here next week for another new story. Thanks for listening. This has been P.E. Rowe, and I'll see you next time.